Welcome to the December event from the Little Gallery. Uh, I'd like to start by stating with gratitude that this evening is on the unceded occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. In the spirit of continuing to be active uh, against colonial injustice and human rights violations, I encourage you to keep on contacting your representatives and boycotting and doing what you can in solidarity with Palestine. As tonight is also the second night of Hanukkah, it's also something to remind folks that anti-Semitism is never acceptable and that Jewish people as a whole should not be scapegoated or conflated with the violent actions of the Israeli state. As MLK said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So from Turtle Island to Palestine, land back and decolonization in our lifetime. So about this event series, the Little Gallery is a project to fulfill the mission of Cross and Crows Books as a queer space supporting Queer creators, especially QT BIPOC authors and artists. The Little Gallery events are organized by artist and occasional poet, Taz Solis, me, <laughs> and I use they them pronouns. On the note of queer spaces and creators, I'd like to shout out another wonderful event happening here tomorrow. There's also going to be, there's an event poster over there. The Flourish QT BIPOC Market, organized by the wonderful Jotica, will be having a pop-up market tomorrow from 12 to 6. You already know how to get here. <laughs> if you'd like to come by tomorrow, there will be other amazing, incredible artists like the ones that will be that are here today and that are performing. <laughs> so I'll just read the bio of the featured monthly artist. So, Every month we have a different visual artist, and Alita is the artist that will be here for the month. So, Alita Morris invites you to an alternate dimension inspired by myths, fantasy, and science fiction, where powerful femmes rule. Alita is a queer artist of mixed Caribbean settler and Canadian ancestry. Her work includes glass painting, digital illustration, and relief prints. Themes th throughout Alita's work are self-love and appreciation for all bodies, love for 2S LGBTQ communities, and encouragement to always look deeper below the surface. And Instagram is honeybutt3rs, so honeybutt is <laughs> <laughs> shout out. <laughs> and also we are trying to get some neon paint light to work for the um, artwork tonight. There is some of the pieces that Alita made with some neon art um, or neon light um, paint, but um, you'll just, I guess, have to bring these pieces home if you'd like to discover the neon brightness of some of these pieces. And so for the performers tonight, we're going to start with Dietry. This poem is called My Universe Immortal. I call to the stars and the earth and the sun and the moon. Swiftly now, the change is coming soon. Tell the waters and the stones and the winds to wake. The sacred fires are in bloom and soon will quake. A far-flung star traveler forged in the heart of the sun will reach arms out glistening after many battles hard won and wrap the robe of many colors around humanity's waist, as all life joins the chorus which cannot be erased. Come quickly, good ancestors of every kind and kin. Chase out the shadows that lurk in the places you have been. Hear me, great guardians of every time and place. Watch over these brave, shining ones in everything they'll face. Return now, lost splinters of consequential souls. Bring back with you the knowledge 
and the treasures that you hold. Come down, light of wholeness, in ways both old and new. I call in every blessing, but the rest is up to you. Hi, I'm Dietrich. I am a Reiki master. I am also an animism healing practitioner, um, better understood in English-speaking languages as a shaman, but that's a misappropriated term, so I don't use it. Um, I'm also an author, and I'm going to read an excerpt from this book that I wrote called Billy's Clint. This book is really silly, by the way. Very <laughs> different tone. <laughs> I dreamed of mages. One mage, actually, and he looked nothing like the one in my drawing. His skin was burnt umber, his face framed by Thatch's wiry black hair, and a beard which fell to his knees. He wore a silken black robe, and an aura of darkness hovered around him like an anti-glow. The shadows he threw off didn't feel evil or frightening. They were warm and comfortable, like a womb. We were in an open plain, a barren landscape. He didn't see me at first. As soon as our eyes met, a look of relief washed over his face. And he moved his lips as if speaking, but no sound came out that I could hear. And I couldn't read what he was saying. I kept a hand in my ear and leaned toward him. Still nothing. Perplexed, I shook my head and moved in toward him. Maybe if I was close enough, I could hear what he was trying to say. He cupped his hands at each side of his mouth in an attempt to amplify the non-existent non sound. But zero multiplied by a million is still zero. Now I was close enough to touch him, but it was obvious this was a silent dream. I shook my head again. Frustrated, he gesticulated wildly. Unsurprisingly, this did not help. Then the landscape changed. We were in a spacious yard behind a two-story white stucco house. The building had a gable and valley roof that swayed inward slightly on one side. There were paned windows with black shutters and a chimney with multiple rain caps. The place was at least a hundred years old, and it looked familiar. Before I could figure out why I recognized it, the mage took me by the arm and led me to a cherry tree. It was dead center, an odd place for an otherwise treeless yard. Other than the tall hedges framing the space, it was the only non-grassy <coughs> plant there. Whoever was in charge of landscaping clearly didn't believe in flowers, except for cherry blossoms, of course. The mage pointed at the tree, and there was a sense of urgency in that motion. I nodded at him. I mean, what else could I do? I woke up. But instead of my bedroom, I found myself in some kind of tropical jungle or <coughs> funky forest. There were stems, leaves, and branches everywhere. The air was thick and fresh like nothing I'd ever breathed before. I clutched my teal pencil turned teddy bear tightly in my hand. I sleepwalked during the night. This forest didn't have any birds or bugs, and that made me suspicious. Maybe this was still a dream. I pinched myself. Pulse! I was awake. And I was on my bed, too. I propped myself up on one elbow and blinked hard, hoping it would clear the hallucinations away. That was when something started tickling my ankle. There was a wispy vine that hovered over my left foot, then swept down with a back and forth motion. Like petting. The snarking vine was petting me. Pinpricks of fear erupt erupted all over my skin. This was real. This was really happening. How could this be happening? Maybe Mr. Victor had contacted a rogue mage to curse me and mess with my head? And 
now I had a serious case of the house plants. A thick vine slid over my right shoulder and my adrenaline spiked. No way. <laughs> I was not getting wrapped up in these things. I kicked away the petting vine and slapped off the foliage at my shoulder. Then I felt something sliding over my head. I bolted from the room, screaming at the top of my lungs. My neighbors probably didn't appreciate the noise, but their comfort was not my primary concern. Still gripping the pencil like a good luck charm, I raced out of the building in my bare feet, ignoring the protests of my burnt souls. My chest was tight and my throat was raw from all the terrified yelling, but I didn't pause or slow down one whit. I chanced to look behind me only to discover that the vines were a few paces away. The snarking things were following me. It was well into the night and I was running barefoot down the street while being chased by a magical houseplant. Fantastic. I must have looked like a dip snark, but I didn't care. I gritted my teeth and ran until my feet bled. Then I ran some more. A lace plant. One more short story. Yes. Uh -huh. This one is called The Bargain. Soft served spaghetti, a small and innocent voice piped out. What does that even mean? All spaghetti is soft served, the other snapped back. The tiny being hovered over the author's shoulder and insisted. That's what it looks like, soft-served spaghetti. Wait, what looks like soft-served spaghetti? The author's question was answered by an unearthly, tinkling giggle, followed by, Your handwriting, silly! There was a long pause, and as the author rubbed their temples in frustration, said, a little less backseat driving and a little more navigational assistance would be greatly appreciated. What? You asked for my opinion, the fairy pouted. Yeah, on what I should write. Like, isn't there some kind of magical, mystical message or story I could share to improve people's lives? The author turned to give the fairy in question an accusatory glare, only to discover him was fully playing a game with his own toes. Were you even listening to me? Of course I was, you're my friend! The fairy replied while still completely absorbed in his own little game. The author stared blankly at the magical little being, mystified. Eons stretched between them. Just as the author was wondering whether, the, whether inviting the fairy had been a mistake, the little being jolted upright and said, Well, are you done yet? A bubble of frustration rose in the author's throat. Done? I was waiting for you. Disappointed, the fairy slumped back down. Ah, uh, we can't go anywhere until you're done being mopey, so hurry up and finish. The author's left eye twitched. I don't want to go anywhere. What I want to do is write a good story. The fairy cocked their head at this. But you can't write stories without going to the treasure place. A flicker of sunshine danced and glittered on the bedroom wall. And the author's blood pressure swelled. That doesn't make any sense. I've written tons of stories before without ever going to a... What on earth is a treasure place? The fairy snorted. No. Know what? asked the bewildered author. No, you haven't written a single story without going to the treasure place first. And no, the treasure place is not her. The author blinked. You know what? I don't have time for this. If you're not going to help, just go. Okay, I'll go, but not without my best friend. The fairy replied and touched a finger to the back of the author's head. Suddenly, the world around them zoomed and faded, pinched and grew, 
been peeled away like a potato skin. What remained was a swirling mass of energy, color, sound, and lights like nothing the author had ever before heard, felt, or seen. The author was still processing what had happened when the fairy took them by the hand and skillfully led them forward. The pair zipped and zoomed past a labyrinthine obstacle course of forms and shapes at speeds that would make a race car driver cry. For the first time ever, the author was genuinely grateful to have a fairy for a guide. Without once slowing pace, the fairy called back, I usually don't let you see this part. Sometimes it can make humans dizzy, but isn't this so much fun? Exuberant, the fairy pulled them into a series of loop-de-loops, which compelled the author's lunch to begin knocking at the back of their throat. Sensing this imminent danger, the fairy slowed down and announced, We're there! The writing section. The author took a moment to employ some tactical deep breathing to appease their stomach. Wait, I thought we were going to the treasure place or whatever. The fairy giggled once more. <laughs> we are in the treasure place, silly. But to get to the writing port part, you have to start in the colors and turn left past systems and whoop! I'm not allowed to tell you any more than that. For the first time since arriving, the author took a solid look around. They weren't so much located in as they were enveloped by a dark chamber-like space that had an odd consistency and substance to it, and fluttering all through, along, and beside it were scripts and fonts from every written language on Earth, and some from languages that were not of Earth, too. Each word, letter, character, and glyph was formed out of pure light, never still. The writing was constantly moving, shifting, changing. It's almost as if they're alive, the author breathed. Of course they're alive, the fairy scoffed. A flock of letters cautiously approached the author, hovering all around them like lightning bugs. What am I supposed to do? Do I catch them? Do I read them? Wait, why can't I read them? It's like the words slide out of my mind as soon as I recognize them. The fairy laughed long and hard. Humans are so silly. If the words don't choose you, they won't stay. You can't just grab them without their permission. The author stared at the living words, mesmerized, as more and more of them continued to gather. They began to pulsate and the author felt something hidden deep inside their own chest, pulsating in reply. Oh, yay! This is my favorite part! The fairy clapped their hands in delight. The words gently wrapped around the author and formed a warm, blinking cocoon. Bit by bit, this cocoon became smaller and smaller until it sank down into the author's own skin. Then, with a final magnificent flash of light, the word snapped all the way down into the core of that mysterious realm, deep within the author's chest. An irrepressible rush of inspiration flooded the length and breadth of the author's being. Ready to go back now? The fairy asked with a mischievous grin. Unable to speak, the author nodded and replied. The fairy snapped their fingers, and reality settled itself back into place where it belonged. The instant that the writing desk reformed in front of the author, they snatched up a pen and began scrawling. In a small voice that the author couldn't hear, the fairy whispered, Now for my least favorite part. Reluctantly, the fairy tapped the back of the author's head and withdrew all memory of himself and their magical visit to the treasure place. These memories came away in the form of a milky gray substance that had occasional sparkles in it. The fairy knew it probably tasted delicious, but he had sworn off eating memories years ago. No, this was the mandatory tide for the fairy queen, and one of the many quiet ways that he was able to keep 
his precious human friend safe. After carefully stowing the memory away, he took one last look at his author friend as they scribbled away. Words of light slipping down their arm and flowing into the pen in wavelengths that no human eye could see. The fairy, now hidden, whispered in a voice that no human ear could hear. Until next time, my cranky human friend, have fun writing like soft serve spaghetti. take you on what I wish it's a little poetry uh, roller coaster. I don't really have any long pieces so welcome to hear eight of them. And oh, here they go. This first one it's called It's Okay and I honestly cannot remember when I write when I wrote it. I just found it the other day and was like it's a good way to start. It's okay. You will figure it out. Just take a deep breath. Take a step back. It may seem like a lot. It may be overwhelming. Just remember, you got yourself this far. It's going to be more than okay. Remember, you are no longer alone. Just take a deep breath. Hold my hand. I can lend you some strength. You're not alone. You're gonna be okay. <laughs> A little trigger warning for the next one. Nothing explicit, but it does touch subjects like abuse and violence. Uh, this one is not my personal story, but a friend like 10 years ago it asked me to write something about what they just told me and later on they gave me permission to start sharing it. It's called Tell Me How It Feels. Tell me, what does it feel like to lose your patience? Let me know if you let go, if you take it out on others. Tell me, what does it feel like to see me close my eyes when you raise your hand? Let me know if my screams strong your soul. Tell me, what does it feel like to be fear? Let me know if it gives you power. Are you superior now? Tell me, what does it feel like to see me cry? Let me know if you notice that in my dream side on rest, because you are there. Tell me, what does it feel like to punch and shout? Let me know if I did something wrong, if it's something I can avoid. Tell me, what does it feel like to see the purple of my skin? Let me know if it's amusing to hear the stories I make up. Or if you worry, I might slip up. Tell me, what does it feel like knowing that I went out? Let me know if you would hold me back. Better yet, tell me what does it feel like knowing that I'm not there? Knowing that I'll never let you know anything again. A little lighter note. Uh, this one is called I See You Little One and I wrote it when someone very close to me was struggling with things on the past and all I could see was a hurt inner child. It's called I See You Little One. I see you little one. The one that hides behind the mask see you, little one, the one that runs and hides. I see you, little one. I see you, and I see all that has been done to you. 
I see the secrets you were forced to keep. I see the lies you were forced to tell. I see your pain. I see you, little one. I see you try and fight the voices from the past. I see all the injustice that, when, that was done. I see how the anger just floods your head. I see you, little one. And I promise you will never have to hide again. Going back with the trigger warnings, again, nothing explicit, but it does mention things like PTSD. It's called conversation with my PTSD. Not really. <sighs> there are so many things that I would like to say to my PTSD. Imagine that. Just go straight into conversation. No hesitation. My voice, strong as ever as I watch these words go out into the world. A world I thought I never belonged in. A world that never even said hello. A world that might not even want to hear it. Oh, but what a day my PTSD would have. For me, it's like seeing three people standing, one right by the other, smiling. They've all got these crazy eyes and in their hands, they each carry a small box. A small box full of memories staring at us. I guess that's where I start. I would tell them to stop playing the images in my brain. Throw them, burn them. That's what I'd say. But the thing is, if that shit works, I would have done it months ago. This next one is uh, part of my story and also taking a lot of other people's stories about how it's like living with a chronic illness and having a friend who doesn't really get it. It's called, what would you say? I've been thinking about this for a while now, about something I can no longer allow. There's no going back once the final drop makes you fall apart. I wanted to talk, but I wasn't brave enough. I wanted to ask, but I wasn't brave enough. I kept on my mask. I know it's a lot to handle, and so far, this has not been fair. I can see it in your eyes, at least a small piece of what I think you try to hide. So, let me say one more thing. I don't want you to stay if what you really want is to walk away. I would rather be hurt by your absence than have you slowly get tired. Then you think and there's no way out. Trapped in what I assure you is only mine. So let me try and say it here. And please, I want you to be sincere. If I gave you an out right now, a chance to take a break and don't look down, a chance to go out knowing it's okay to step away, what would you say? Changing a little bit the tone, this one's called It's the Little Things. I've been thinking about what I want in life, like really started to think what it is about life that I want the most. How would I want to spend my time? I want long walks at night with just the light of the moon guiding our path. I want all-nighters stargazing, remembering constellations, or making up our own. I want to spend the afternoon at the park, each with a book in hand. Not really talking, but staying for a while because the nice the sun feels nice. I want a slow type of love. The one that starts slowly building up. Doesn't really get you by surprise. It's the little things. 
It's the details that I know about you and you know about me. It's all about the little things, the boring stuff. Then again, there's nothing really simple or boring about love or life. This one started off as a song that I wrote for my beautiful wife. <laughs> and it's more getting adapted into poem slash song slash poem. It's still a work in progress. It's called When I Finally Say It. That day, that day I thought I heard you say I love you. It was just a moment, a brief second in time breath. We were laughing, smiling, video chatting. I was playing with my hair, playing dumb like any other day. Listening to the story, you were talking so intensely and then you said it. Or at least I thought I heard it. My heart filled and all I could feel was joy and warmth in my heart and soul and, you know, all the cheesy stuff. My mind started racing, heart palpitating, and all I could think was como una noche de repente, las estrellas me dieron suerte y yo a ti te vine a encontrar. It was no accident que te cruzaras en mi mirada. My heart decided que valía la pena apostar. Apostar por este amor que yo en ti vine a encontrar. Found this, that strength that makes my heart crazy, solo te quiero besar. So take my hand, let go of the past, and together we will walk through life. And mom, I love you too. <laughs> this last one, it's more of a compilation of a lot of poems that I did growing up. Uh, I finished this like three, four years ago, and it's more like a summary of, I want to say more than 20, between poems and random phrases that I found that I've been writing since I was, who knows. It's called, But What Do I Know? Uh, for this one, if you would like, I would invite you to close your eyes. Have you ever stopped and questioned who you are? Stopped and asked if you really know what lies in your heart, if you are real, even when, no, when there's no one around. What can you say when all you do is hide? Hide away your feelings, your thoughts, yourself. Think of a big canvas, a painting filled with thousands of colors, flowing freely to life. You see a red as rich as blood. You see the pain. You see a blue as deep as the ocean. You see the calm. You see a white as pure as a child's soul. You see your inner child. You see a green that fills of life. You can see nature in its eyes. Now stop. What happens if you get too close? Nothing? Or maybe a blur? Like a dark and blurry stain that blinds you from the beauty of the world. Now, what if I told you it's just a matter of taking a step back? paying attention, of finding the colors in your canvas, your creation, your fears and protections. Look at them. Look at every detail. Go back in time. Feel it. Let every fiber of your body stop with every memory. Go back to that home, to that park those arms. Let it overflow you with emotion, with sensation. The past leaves, leaves its 
mark. The past shapes. It shapes ideas and thoughts, thoughts that change with experience and in mind. There's only one thing that I can say. Press pause. Take a breath. Stop and question. Why do we insist on resisting change? In not letting go. Not daring to try. In not leaving a harmful place just because it got comfortable. What would happen if you took back your power and learned how to use the fear? A fear that has been with you for so long. Fear that has tried to make you fall. Fear that has seen you grow. Maybe accidentally made you stronger. The past made you what you are today, what I am today. The past leaves its mark and teaches. It teaches to scream in a world that wants to shut up, wants to shut you up, that wants to hide you, that wants to hide the pain felt by so many others that just want to find their voice, to find themselves after so many years spent in the dark, Understand that not everything is bad. Learn that they're worth something. That they're not alone. That you can be happy. It's not easy. I wouldn't know where in the world to start. It's a consuming job for one soul. A soul that's tired of fighting every day. A fight no one chose, chose to be in. A fight with no adversary. A fight with no end. A fight I plan on winning someday. Let us travel to <laughs> Chloe's. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> to Chloe's poetry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Chloe Hawking. Um, I'm a poet, but I write other things as well. I think, is this fifth? Is it my fifth book, Rob? Fifth, yeah. Fifth, yeah. It came out last month. Um, it's called World Without Ends. Uh, so I'm just going to dive right in. I did bring, because it can be hard to listen to poem after poem after poem with no time to reflect, um, I brought all y'all a, just a little silly story. Because some of the poems are a bit heavy. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a trigger warning at the right place. Okay. The moon, haggard. An unwashed slattern slices the cold sky like a stinging blade. A poet whose murdered sleep, dangerous in other words, is writing an invocation full of spelling and grammar into the sharp, chill moon. Can you call your poems back? when they fly like hunting bats. This body is not an apology. Call off your dogs. Find love for the shivering naked self, you and me united by vulnerabilities. The parts that don't work, the parts that don't fit, the parts infused with shame, squirming uncomfortable, do not give it a this body like unbaked bread. Okay, here's so here's a couple, and um, there's both a trigger trigger warning for the mention of human rights abuses of trans people. Where she's from. If she wears the dress I bought her outside, she's committing an offense against children. Where she's from, when drag queens dress pretty and read to kids in libraries, they have to bring their own human refrigerators with semi-automatic weapons. I wish I was kidding about that. It sounds like the kind of joke I tell, escalation into absurdity. But it's no joke. Arizona, Arkansas, Missouri, Nebraska, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, West Virginia, I could go on.
standing. I love her and I hold her hand in public and forget for a minute that some people want to forget it. So that's that. Oh, so it's so challenging to do this in a mask. Oh my goodness. I hope it's not, it, it doesn't sound like Charlie Brown teacher. No, it no, sounds very good. It's okay. Good. The summoning. Ah, uh, there it is again, Linda thought to herself. The whole left side of her face and body tingled as she stood at the cash register dealing with Mrs. Parsons. She tried to ignore the feeling while the older woman sorted nickels and dimes out onto the counter to pay for her $2.99 video rental. The tingling meant he was close by. Linda shifted her weight to the other foot, then back again as she stood behind the register. She, stripped, she slipped a strand of long brown hair behind her ear. Mrs. Parsons said, All righty, 270, 280, 290, 295, 296, 297, 298, 299, and slid the coins to Linda's side of the glass counter with her parchment fingertips. Mrs. Parsons' hair had been rinsed with bluing, and it was piled on top of her head like a swirly ice cream cone. Her brown eyes twinkled with mischief. While Linda, while Linda picked up the coins and put them in the cash register, she noticed that Mrs. Parsons was stiffing her for the tax, but Linda didn't care. She could make the difference up through the take a penny, leave a penny jar more quickly than she could explain to Mrs. Parsons, again, that video rentals had tax on them, even for seniors. And she needed to get Mrs. Parsons out of the store before he decided to come in. Thanks, Mrs. Parsons. Enjoy your movie, said Linda, a slight quaver in the brightness of her voice. Mrs. Parsons paused halfway between the counter and the front door. She sniffed the air, one eyebrow raised. Is everything all right, dear? You sound a little nervous. Linda forced herself to laugh. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. I just didn't sleep well last night. Mrs. Parsons tissed and said, Oh, you young girls, burning the candle at both ends. You need your beauty sleep, just like the rest of us, dear. Get out, get out, get out, Linda chanted inside her head. But she kept a saccharine smile pasted on her face, not wanting to give Parsons more conversation fodder. She felt that Mrs. Parsons probably knew she was lying, but that didn't matter, as long as the woman exited as soon as possible. Seeing no other conversational hooks, the older woman walked out of the store and started to make her way to the bus stop a block away. The opposite direction he usually comes from, thank goodness. Or is it think evil? He was the demon Asmodeus. Linda had managed to summon him after hours in the shop based on rituals she'd seen in old Roman Polanski movies. When the ritual worked, she was almost as surprised as Modius himself. That was several days ago, and since then, Linda and the demon had fallen into a routine. During the day, he wandered the one kilometer radius allowed by their metaphysical tethering. He cloaked himself in an invisibility spell of his own design to avoid uncomfortable questions about his horns, hooves, and tail. Sadly, the invisibility spell did nothing to cloak his odor of sulfur and rotting garbage. When Asmodeus was out people watching and exploring, Linda worked in the video store. After dark, Linda and the demon spent time in the closed shop together watching movies, eating popcorn, and trying to figure out what this was between them, this being their relationship. According to Asmodeus, summoners and summonees develop a spiritual connection at the moment of summoning that cannot be sundered, even by death. The problem was, neither the young woman nor the demon had ever done this before, so neither had a blueprint for a proper summoner-summonee relationship. When Linda had inquired about simply returning the demon back to whatever hellscape he hailed from, all he said was, you broke it, you bought it. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning what, she'd asked. Meaning, you summoned me here, now I'm your responsibility. Linda hadn't known what to think about that. Honestly, the demon sounded a lot like her ex-boyfriend, Jason, who, before they broke up, was probing to leaving all responsibility for their life together at her feet. Linda was already starting to regret having summoned a demon. Stupid witchcraft, Linda muttered to herself. The store door opened on its own, accompanied by a light waft of something dreadful. That you, Asmodeus? asked Linda. Expecting someone else, came the reply from seemingly empty air. Hardy har har, you're hilarious, replied Linda as she stepped out from behind the counter and walked to the door to latch it and switch off the opening sign. As the natural light outside dimmed, Linda walked from window to window, shutting the Venetian blinds. 
Passers-by didn't need a view of the nocturnal doings in the video store, particularly with the demon present. Linda sat on the counter and watched Asmodeus slowly appear as the sun set. First his hooves were visible, then his velvet breeches bounded at the knee, then his bare muscular torso. Finally, his large scaly bald head, replete with curved black horns, came into view. His horns gleamed under the fluorescent lighting in the store, and his deep-set eyes glittered like barbecue embers. He smelled of rotting oranges and moldy cheese rind. Ew. <laughs> so have you thought more about the move, As Asmodeus? Linda picked up a feather duster and started to whisk it over the empty VHS and DVD cases. I have, and I don't see what advantage there is in tethering you to my apartment rather than tethering you here. Well, what about not tethering me at all? I'm not comfortable with that. Comfortable? How comfortable do you think I am, sleeping on that smelly old couch in the back room every night after you leave? The couch wasn't smelly before you started lying on it. <laughs> I appreciate it's not ideal. Not ideal. It's you who summoned me, remember? I didn't get a vote in the matter. There I was, minding my own business besides the river sticks, and then all of a sudden I'm slowly materializing in your stockroom. Linda sighed and pushed her bangs out of her eyes. I said, I'm sorry for summoning you. How was I to know that you summon it, you bought it, rules are in place? <laughs> I'd have never dreamed of summoning anyone if I knew it was permanent. Permanent, and now your responsibility to look after me, don't forget. Bang. Bang, 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 bang. Someone's at the door, whispered Linda. She put a finger to her lips. Bang. Bang, 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 bang. Persistent. I'll go see who it is and what they want, said Linda, striding toward the door. She unlocked the door with a snap and opened it in eye width, expecting a burly, irate customer. Instead, she saw Mrs. Parsons. Everything all right, dear? asked Mrs. Parsons. Yes, of course, everything's fine. Would you mind terribly if I came in to see how fine it is for myself? Linda pressed her lips together for a moment. Mrs. Parsons, the store is closed. I'm getting ready to go home. You can't come in. I'm afraid I really must insist, said the older woman as she shoved the door with enough force to make Linda stumble and fall to her knees. She was shockingly strong. What the? Linda yelled. Ah, now, there, see? I thought I smelled demon when I was in here earlier. The nose never lies. Linda regained her footing and looked from Mrs. Parsons back to the demon, back to Mrs. Parsons. She can only goggle at Parsons. What in the world has happened? Out loud, she said. I'm confused. Mrs. Parsons ignored Linda and stared at the demon. Up to your old tricks, eh, Gary? The demon backed up a few steps. Just a little harmless fun, Parsons. Don't be such a spoil sport, he replied. Gary, Linda said, brows raised. He told me his name was Asmodeus, Prince of Darkness. <laughs> he lied, said Mrs. Parsons. He's Gary, purveyor of trash. His <laughs> principal duty is making garbage rot faster than it would do otherwise. He's a big faker. He's not even all that evil, exactly. More annoying than evil, to tell the truth. Linda could see beads of sweat break out on Gary's forehead. The, the demon stepped behind a fully loaded display case, placing a barrier between himself and Mrs. Parsons. He licked his lips and fiddled with a button on his breeches. Can someone explain to me what is going on, Linda said. Mrs. Parsons looked over at her, her brown eyes soft. Stay calm, dear. This is just a common demonic infestation, nothing that can't be solved in a tick, she said. She opened her handbag and took out a leather pouch. She opened the pouch and took a pitch of whatever was inside it and cast it on the ground in front of her. Don't worry, it's only salt. It sweeps up once we've gotten rid of him, that pest, said Mrs. Parsons. But he told me I couldn't banish him, that the summonee summoner relationship cannot be sundered. That's what he always says. He's just trying to mooch snacks and a place to stay, the big figure. <laughs> hey, Parsons, I'm standing right here. Are you trying to hurt my feelings, said Gary the Demon. Parsons laughed as she walked slowly towards the display case, casting salt as she went. Pretty brave talk for someone who's trying to hide behind a display, display case from a sweet old lady. You aren't any of those things except old, Parsons, snapped Gary. Mrs. Parsons reached the counter and blew some salt from her palm into Gary's face. Now who's trying to hurt feelings, hmm? You demons are all the same. Gary squealed in pain when the salt hit him. Parsons chanted, Wretched demon that thou be, flee this case and leave us be. We are warded from all harm. Gary, you jerk, you bought the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Reaching into her pocket, Mrs. Parsons drew out some kind of dried herb and threw a handful at the demon. He disappeared with a squeal from behind the counter, leaving nothing behind but the smell of slightly singed rubber tires. Dried Angelica works to banish his kind whenever they come around to pester us, 
you'd best remember that if you're going to work spells in the back room of the video store. Linda realized that her mouth of the head was hanging open. She closed it. Then she opened it again. Before she could speak, Mrs. Parsons said, Oh, come on now, don't be surprised. Surely you don't think you're the only person to experiment with magic. Uh, I, I suppose I did, replied Linda. Well, now you know you're wrong. For heaven's sakes, how did you end up summoning Gary of all demons? He's so annoying. <laughs> A petulant pride in you, really. You're lucky it was just him, not one of the seriously evil ones. I, I, well, it's a long story, stammered Linda. Well, if you've got the time to tell the tale, I've got the ears to listen to it. Provided you can rustle up a cup of tea, it's a cold night. <laughs> Mary and Jane, with a focus on gender, mental health, and being an unwilling member of the working class, Mary and Jane hoped to make performing poetry look easy in an effort to trick an audience member into reading their poetry next time. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I've got a couple things to read. Um, first is a poem that was published in the Vancouver Pride Magazine, uh, 2022. Uh, I think it's, I chose to read this tonight because I think with like, in the state of the pandemic we're in, I mean, we're all in a mask event and the CDC is now recommending people wear masks again. Uh, I think this felt like a, the proper time to read this out loud, so here we go. It's called Precious Steps. I'm treading lightly in the six million shadows of those who could not be here today, for this is dedicated to their memory. It still feels unreal like a steep hill that forced us all to slow down and acknowledge who was around us in the eternity of a day after day after day. Who could we turn to? Who could we trust? People have been unmasking, complacent in their faith that they can outwit an ongoing pandemic that still threatens us. Who has our back? Who will keep us safe? In the eternity of a day after day after day, the answer was always up to us. The answer is us. Um, I'd like to read uh, for you my zine, Where Have You Been? Um, I sell these for $5 cash, or if you ever come by, I also sell them here, as long as some other zines that I've written. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right in. These first two are kind of like sister poems. Um, they do deal with paranoia, so if anyone, if that's a trigger warning for anyone, um, this is about what, what you can believe it, uh, in yourself. First one's called Cacophony of the House. Why the hell tell me what they think they think, she thought she had thought. And the thought she thought they had thought forms microbeads along the crests. Forms crochet grit knocks in her chest, second guessing what she knows best. The thought they thought she thought gets bound and caught in her throat. She starts to cough and laugh and distress. Why are my thoughts such a frustrating mess? This next one is mind control. I used to believe in mind control, an invisible battle for my soul. A struggle, I wretch, I lose my breath. Who can see me struggle with this predicament? <laughs> I have to laugh. It's all in my head. My body jerks with a reaction. Is that really what I said? Is that what I really think? Can you see my thoughts, or do they just stink and you're left smelling a burning brush fire? Um... This poem is about uh, revenge. It's called, And I'm Sure. And I'm sure a hyena is still conscious of his laugh, a nervous tick he has to cut his anxiety in half. In confusion, he gasps and exasperates, what kind of tyrants run this place? To be left staring at an empty face. And I'm sure an octopus struggles with its clutch, 
grasping at the past because it's familiar to the touch. They cannot let go, and they wonder, is this my destiny? Another sucker for that ecstasy. And I'm sure a black widow still cries about her fate. To choke the living love out of someone she embraced. To justify the pain. To save face. She cries out, what cursed arms I must possess. While replacing her legs. The way she knows best. Um... This was the first poem I wrote when I was 16 years old, and I published it on a Valentine's Day um, as a Valentine's to myself. This one's called Growing Paints. I remember it was in the grocery store. I asked to see my mom's glasses and put them on for the first time, for the fun of it. Mom, Mom, I can see everything. Well, son, looks like we need to get you glasses. And I remember it was over a summer that I would wake up in the night with excruciating leg pain. My mom took me to the doctor. Well, son, looks like you've got growing pains. It hurts, but it stops eventually. And I remember the first time jumping off of the big rock at the Puntledge River. My dad was beside me, advising me of the opportunities. Well, son, you gotta look at the windows along the bottom of the rapids so you can see the bottom of where you're diving to. <laughs> it's been a few decades since these events took place, and as with any troubles, with time and perspective, I've been able to see with fleeting clarity. I've been able to acknowledge the danger signs, but the doctor was dead wrong about the growing pains. Um, this one goes out to my friend Ben, um, he's another member of the working class that we really, we really, uh, touch base on. Uh, anyway, it's called Associations. It goes like this. I found a shattered glass mirror, and I squeezed the shards in my hands in hopes that a little blood on my reflection will help me piece it back together. Then I think about the peanuts in peanut butter. How, under a little pressure, they break down individually under the weight of the machine. How it smooths them into a coherent mess. And these days, I find myself spread thin and broken like glass and peanut butter, trying to become whole again. This is one that, that I ended up pulling my title from. It's called Long Roads. People change, rearrange into strangers. It's alarming at first, but then the danger of having room to grow becomes a joy we share. Pull up a chair. Let's catch up, friend. How are you doing? Where have you been? Um, just one last one, and this one, uh, <laughs> shout out service industry, uh, is called A Midnight Twelve Top. Like a waitress who has lost her balance, I buckle at the knees from the weight of carrying too many plates. There's a history in these shoulders, not one I've heard, but instinctively know, like an old song in the throat from my forgotten floor mothers. I'm speaking with them now. One says, resist. Another, persevere. And another says, learn to fight with your fists. You might need it this year. And above all, they say in unison, above all, remain dear. And I cannot let them down. So I pick up the plates, and I balance them again. There's such a history in these shoulders. <laughs> 